Hi there. Thank you guys for coming tonight. My name is Courtney Knuff, and I'm our executive director. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming you guys this evening, and I'm so glad that you're all here. Before we get started this evening, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Economic Club of Colorado. Um, we were founded in 1985 by a group of business leaders who wanted to have a forum to discuss economics, um, politics, current events, and um, business. So um, when I was brought on board, we did about six events a year, and there are events like this with a keynote speaker and dinner or lunch. Um, we since have added six to eight other events a year that are smaller, more intimate um, gatherings called backstage events. At our backstage events, you get to hear from a business leader, entrepreneur, um, executive director, and kind of go behind the scenes and also get to know other economic club members. If you haven't been to a backstage event, um, please reach out to me or any other ECC member in the room because I think you'll really enjoy those. Um, both our backstage events and our signature events would not be possible without our sponsors. So I wanted to take a minute to briefly thank our sponsors. Um, and tonight we have so many to be grateful for. Our annual sponsors um, our gold at the gold level are Baird, Whipley, and Blue Room. Our silver level sponsors are First Bank, Johnson Moving, <laughs> First Bank, Johnson Moving and Storage, and Greenberg Trawick. And tonight we get to have um, the honor of having some additional special event sponsors: Winged Kill Group, and um, a double sponsor tonight, Blue Room. So thank you all for that. Thank you. And then also our table sponsors, Case, Compass, Heritage Oaks Holdings, Monroe Capital, and PEMCO. Um, so as I mentioned, Blue Room twice. Thanks. Blue Room um, is a big supporter of Economic Club and specifically Min Sohn, um, who is our chairman. Min couldn't be here tonight because um, he had a trip to Asia planned, so he's really, really bummed to miss this. And so he asked his friend, Mark Falcone, um, to stand in his place and introduce Peter tonight. So Mark, if you'd like to join me, we will get things kick kicked off. Uh, well, welcome, and uh, I've, I have to say I have uh, been a uh, acolyte of Peter Zeehan uh, since I read his book, The Accidental Superpower, many years ago. And I'm a, uh, I'm a real estate developer, uh, so I'm effectively in the business of the human ecology. And I think uh, I've, I've been a history student my whole life. I was a history student um, all through school. And I remember uh, having this sensation when I was reading the accidental superpower where I thought to myself, is it really possible that none of these professors and teachers that I had over the years ever connected the dots as succinctly as Peter had in, in those, uh, on all those really remarkable observations that he reveals um, in that story. And as somebody who is constantly trying to uh, lift himself a little higher in the clouds to get more context and perspective, um, I, found the, uh, I found the ability to sort of knit together all of these um, remarkable convergences of geography and technology and how that really influenced and shaped the evolution of, uh, of human society, um, incredibly powerful and incredibly useful. And uh, so uh, from that point forward, uh, Peter's observations and his ongoing thinking uh, have become an important touchstone for me when I'm trying to sort of synthesize what might be happening in the world. And I often find myself uh, in situations where um, you know, some significant new set of um, geopolitical events are sort of emerging, and I really, I literally try to transport myself inside the context of the way Peter would look at it and, uh, and, and consider what, what, what he might see in it. And uh, so I, I have to say I'm incredibly excited to 
hear his uh, reflections on what's happening today. And for those of you that haven't had the benefit of uh, either reading some of his work or listening to some of his podcasts, um, you're in for a real treat. And I assure you, it will reshape your perspective if you haven't already had the opportunity to be influenced by it. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, invite Peter up here and get the program started. And uh, thanks to Min and others for uh, making this happen. I'm, uh, I, by the way, Peter, I was so excited when I realized so, a few years ago that you live in Colorado, that we can claim you our own. Um, yeah, I was trying to figure out where you might live. Are you going to reveal that to us tonight? I live about Tim Carl. Oh, okay. So you're kind of a, a metropolitan Denver person in some ways. Yeah, you, and I, yeah. I, remember, I remember hearing a reference in something that you live at like 7,000 feet or something. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, with that, uh, Peter, come on up. All right. Hey, everybody. So this is one of those awkward things where they asked for three hours of materials but only gave me 25 minutes. We're going to jump right in with the fun guy, Stalin. Most important person to live in the last 500 years. Not because of what he did, but because who he scared. Us. We were so terrified of facing down Stalin on the plains of Europe that we changed the entire world so that we could bribe hundreds of millions of people to willingly be caught cannon fodder for us in the Cold War. We sent our Navy out to patrol the global ocean so that anyone could go anywhere at any time, interact with any partner, access any commodity or market, if in exchange, you stood between us and Stalin. And that gave us globalization, that gave us free trade, that is the world that we know. And then in 1992, it was all over. And then a series of ever more nationalist and narcissistic political contests, of which we're still in that cycle, we went time after time after time with the guy who wanted less to do with the world. That continues from Trump to Biden, the only difference between their international economic policies is that Biden hired a grammar checker. <laughs> Every tariff that Trump created is still there. It's just now been codified. Now, this affects everything. The rise to globalization, our backing away from it, all of it. But I think the best way to start out with this crowd is finance. This is net worth by decade. It's a, it's a familiar story. As you get older, your wealth goes up, you get a better job, you start a business. But the real magic happens when you turn 50, because that's the year that your single biggest expense, your youngest child, is now someone else's problem. And the money that you save from being an empty nester, you used to pay down your second biggest expense, which is typically your homestead. And on average in North America, when you turn 55, the house has been paid for, your income is the highest it will ever be, your expenses are under control, and the delta, that's 70% of global private capital, 55 to 65. That's literally where the money is. That's what drives the system. And then you turn 65 and you liquidate. Because if there's a currency crash or a market crash, you're, you're screwed and you have to move in with your kids and the millennials have made it very clear to the boomers that that's a one-way experience. <laughs> So, this is normal, boring even, until Stalin, because Stalin changed the way we live. This is the demographic profile for the Koreans at the dawn of globalization. Pretty standard profile, children at the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on the other. Normally it's a pyramid, because normally we're all living on farms. And when you live on a farm, kids are free labor. You have as many of them as you can put up with, plus one. That's how you find out it's too many. <laughs> but with Stalin and globalization, everyone could specialize, and we could industrialize, and all the industrial jobs were in town. So we moved from the farms to the cities. And when you move into the cities, kids are no longer free labor. They're a free source of migraines, and adults are not dumb, so we had fewer of them. 70 years later, here's the Koreans now. Very different economic model. When you have a pyramid, when you have lots of young people, it's driven by consumption, kids and cars, education. But the skill sets are low, productivity is low, 
and there aren't enough people aged 55 to 65 to generate the capital, so you have a high inflation, high capital cost environment. But when it opens up, you no longer have the consumption. You have workers who literally have decades of experience. They're very productive. The tax base is huge. You're awash in capital that's cheap and available everywhere. Your infrastructure is great. Your education is great. But you no longer have anyone to sell to. You have to export. Very different model. And the whole world has gone through this transition. At different starting points, at different speeds, but we're all on the same road. And this decade, the Koreans run out of road because that bulge at the top moves into mass retirement. And we don't have an economic model as a species for what might work if you don't have consumption or production or investment. But the Koreans are gonna find out this decade. And they're not gonna be alone. The Germans, bottom left, same basic concept. If you want a Beamer, get it now. Get 10 years of parts, you're gonna need those. United States, very different situation for two reasons. Number one, we did not invest our economy into globalization. We're the least involved trading country in the world because it was a bribe. If we had invested our system, we would have just been another empire. Second, there's a lot of elbow room in this country. So we didn't go from farm to city. We went from farm to small town to suburb to city. And those two extra steps bought us a lot of time. Our birth rate fell, just not as fast. You got Mexico, late bloomer Mexico, didn't really start the industrialization process until 1992 with NAFTA. And since then, their birth rate has halved just like it has everywhere else, which means that they're running out of young people now. And net migration from Mexico to the US has now been negative for the last 15 years. Central America, by the way, most of the illegal migrants coming up now, they got a free trade with us 10 years after NAFTA. Another 10 years, that flow is going to be gone too. And then you've got China. That is already one of the five fastest aging workforces in human history, in the entire historical record. And three months ago, they updated their data. They're now saying that since 2017, their birth rate has dropped by over two thirds, more than what happened to the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. And the Shanghai Academy of Sciences, who are the wise men who interpret the government statistics, say that this is still wrong, and that they've overcounted the population of China by over 100 million people, with all of the missing millions being people who would have been born since the one-child policy was adopted, which is a fairly sterile and academic way of saying that everyone who's missing is under age 40, suggesting that these yellow bars don't even exist. This is China's last decade, not as an economic model, as a country, as a unified industrialized nation state. And now, assuming no more revisions, we are looking at the Han ethnicity vanishing from this planet by the end of this century. The challenge isn't the Chinese rise, it's the Chinese collapse. Okay, a little bit on us. <clears throat> could talk about this for an hour. Okay, baby boomers, largest generation ever, which is another way of saying that, that they are the largest capital class ever and the largest workforce ever. As of the fourth quarter of last year, half of them had already retired. And so, over the last three to four years, we have seen capital costs triple because they liquidated their savings. It's not the business cycle, it's not the Fed, it's demographics and it will last until another large generation enters their mid-50s. Those will be the millennials. <laughs> I see a lot of millennials out of there. A Couple things to keep in mind. Number one, the oldest millennial next year is 45. The young bucks, you are not. And in 12 years, when you're entering your late 50s, <laughs> millennials having midlife crises, I can't wait. But you will finally fill out the ranks of the capital suppliers in a way that my generation, Gen X, can't. We just have to wait for you to grow up. <sighs> Workforce. The generation coming in from below is the Zoomers. Smallest generation ever. So the largest generation ever is leaving. The smallest generation is taking their place. This calendar year, that's a shortage of 450,000 
workers. That number will increase for the next 11 years before peaking out at an annual shortfall of 900,000. This will last until another large generation is born, grows up, gets trained and entered the workforce. Those will be the millennials' kids, and they won't enter the workforce in large numbers until 2045. So if you ignore everything else that I say today, remember this, hire, borrow, now. These are the cheapest capital costs for at least 12 years and the cheapest labor costs for at least 22. Don't wait three months or six months or nine months or for the business cycle to turn. That's not the limiting factor here. It's the number of people. And if you want to grow a workforce of 30-year-olds, 30 year, 30 you had to start 31 years ago. That's just how that works. All right. Let's um, put some bullets in the Chinese. This is average monthly wages for a number of Southeast Asian countries that I'm actually pretty bullish in, on in a deglobalizing world. Here are our Mexican partners, very competitive right in the middle. And here are the Chinese. We've never, never seen that sort of increase in labor costs, not even during the Black Death. The Chinese are now one of the most non-competitive workforces out there. Mexican labor is twice as skilled and one-third the cost. The only reason we still think of China as a major economic power is because of the sunk cost of the industrial plant. And that's not nothing. $35 trillion of industrial infrastructure, that's huge. You don't just turn a page and forget that that existed but they're no longer price competitive in anything that they produce. It's legacy, that's it. Let's talk finance again. Uh, this is the private credit curve for the United States and that build from the right side to the middle peak, that's the subprime build, 2000 to 2007. We doubled total private credit in eight years. It was too much, too fast. As a result, we had a recession that knocked 5% off of headline GDP. This is our baseline. Same data, different scale. Again, the bump in the middle, doubling. Here's Canada. Any Canadians here today? Wow, good security. <laughs> okay. Now, I would argue that from 2000 to 2007, the Canadians had the healthiest banking sector on the planet. They had made none of the mistakes that we did. They didn't have something we call, that they called subprime. They didn't do asset-backed securities. And then the Great Recession happened, and they had a very Canadian response. Americans just had the greatest recession ever. We can totally have a greater recession. And they systematically dismantled every safety on the entire sector and tripled down on every bad decision we had made for the previous decade. They get to about 2014, they're like, oh, Oh, maybe we don't want to win this one. And they dialed it back. I wouldn't say they're out of the woods, but I feel a lot more confident now than I did 10 years ago. Germany. If you want to get a house in Germany, you don't get your 20% together and go to your bank for the other 80. When you talk to the bank, they're like, this is great. You want a house, wonderful. You give us a deposit today for what your mortgage payment would be. And then you do that again next month and the month after and the month after and the month after for 60 months. You have to prove you're not a credit risk. Then, five years on, you can apply for the loan. There are many deep, structural, I'd argue system-killing problems in the German system right now. Credit overextension is not on the list. <laughs> it is in Greece! Seven-fold increase of credit in seven years. So far, they've had a 65% reduction, or sorry, 55% reduction in their headline GDP, and then COVID happened and just scrambled all the data. Here's Australia. Now, Australia and the United States have a very similar political system, federal system, and regulation of finance, just like here, is at the, at the top. Just a handful of people do it. It's one of the reasons why the regulations in our countries tend to be more effective. Decisions could be made very, very quickly and implanted on the whole system. So when the financial crisis hit here in 07, Sheila Baer of the FDIC, Paulson at Treasury, Bernanke at the Fed, they all basically crowded around a two-top at a bar in DC and literally on the back of cocktail napkins, she tells this story better than I do, um, 
worked out what we now know as TARP in like a half an hour. And it was part of policy within 24 hours. And it was, it was very American. The taxpayer was there, the federal government was there, the Fed was there, but if you had done something just mind-blowingly stupid as a lender or as a lendee, you were on the hook for some of the losses. In Australia, they had a very similar response. Without that American catch, all mortgages were guaranteed. And if you could prove that you could make your mortgage payments with a 100% government guarantee, then you automatically qualified for a second mortgage, and a third, and a fourth. The Aussies have not yet begun their credit correction. And when they do, you will not want to be down under. India, very similar policy to Australia, but if you wanted the credit guarantees, you had to be a friend of the prime minister. And here's China. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> This is what we're scared of? On a good day, China is a badly run Enron. We know how this story ends. We know how this story always ends. That doesn't mean you don't get growth, though. When the money is free and bottomless, sure, you get growth. You heard what's going on in their housing sector? Shanghai Academy of Sciences, same, the same wise men, they now estimate there are enough spare condos that have never been lived in that collectively they could house somewhere between 1.5 and 3 billion people. Yes, they got growth building them, but they're probably only worth 10 cents on the dollar. Can you imagine in this market here, if we had a 200% overbuild in housing, what would happen to the market? And that's the life saving of most Chinese. So there's gonna be a social aspect to this when it goes down. Oh, and, and this loan bilge, wrong word, loan, loan boom, the sector that's most affected is agriculture. So they get famine too. Now this is normally where a hands-on government with a good understanding of the problem and a lot of smart people can buy time. That's not what they have. Chairman Xi has intimidated into silence or literally exiled, exiled, executed, or imprisoned everyone within the system who's capable of conscious thought. He's destroyed all lines of information exchange to make sure that no one can rise up to challenge him. His purges have taken out everyone. Uh, it's affected the, the data system now. So like, okay, you may have heard that when they reopened from COVID, they just stopped collecting data on COVID. They stopped collecting death data. That's the only way they could do that. They're not collecting data on consumer confidence. Bond transaction data. How do you have a bond market if nobody knows what's on offer or who bought what? Well, because the bond market by definition is independent of the state-owned banks. They would be fine if that just went away. What worries me is more personal political biographies of local leaders, college dissertations. He's made sure that in the next generation of young people have no way to get their fingers into the system so they can never rise up to be a challenge. I'm gonna give you two examples of how this has just become all encompassing, the information shutdown. So the first one, you guys remember in February of 2021 when the lights went out in Beijing and they didn't get a policy to address that rolling black and brownouts throughout the country for 14 months. We now know that the person who told Xi that the country was experiencing brown and blackouts was Joe Biden. It came up on a Zoom call in September. No one would tell him. Now, don't be mad at Uncle Joe. He didn't know it was a secret. We, we could see it from orbit. It was in USA Today. It's like we thought everyone knew. But he's established himself as the sole decision maker. At the same time, he's destroyed the lines of communication. So he doesn't know what he needs to make a decision on. But I think the better example I can give you is that stupid balloon. <laughs> now, when that thing floated in from Canada, thanks for that, by the way, Canada, 
I had the same response as our president. Clearly, this is a spy platform. Shoot it down. It was 350 feet across. It was dangling something the size of an Embraer jet. You guys know Embraers? It's like the Barbie dream jets, two seats on one side, one on the other. They're cramped, they're tiny, unless they're hanging from a balloon, in which case they're pretty sizable. Shoot it down, let's see what we're dealing with. But unlike China, in the United States, there's information flow within the government. We're not that far gone. And somewhere in the basement of the Pentagon is some dude who's socially awkward, who's just like, I love balloons. <laughs> and his report made it up to the top. And so the CIA director and the defense secretary sat the president down, like, Mr. President, we really don't want you to shoot this thing down. It's not a national security threat. We know where it's going. It's going to float over the missile silos in Montana. But Mr. President, if you're not planning on nuking anyone in the next 96 hours, the hatches over those missiles will be closed because they're always closed. The Chinese will get pictures of closed hatches from seven miles away. This does not scare us. It's not a threat. It's an opportunity. Because if you let this thing float on its merry way, we'll put a spy helicopter below it and a spy plane above it and every whisper sensor we can get our hands on, we will train on it. We will copy all of their cryptography. We'll see how they're using the satellite network to send symbols. We'll see how they're bouncing things off of our civilian network. And Mr. President, a reminder, we have a more complete and numerous and powerful hacking capacity in the US government than all other governments on the planet combined. So if you let this thing do its thing, we will be able to trace the signals, not back to the city or the block or the building or the floor or the office, to the terminal where it's controlled. And we will hack the tar out of that terminal and we will mark everyone who comes into contact with it and we will rip out the guts of their intelligence system from the inside out. Mr. President, this is the intelligence breakthrough of the decade. And they handed it to us. So that's what we did. We now know from the after action that Chairman Xi was unaware of the balloon until after it had been shot down. We know that their defense ministry was unaware of it until it crossed over from Canada. It was just some asshat in the intelligence directorate who was like, wolf warrior diplomacy, this is how you stick it to the Americans. It was the, it was the dumbest thing I have seen any government do in the last 20 years and just dial back your internal film there on what's gone down in the last two decades. We have had a lot of dumb. This sort of disconnect is happening at every level of the Chinese government because no one can make a decision and no one will give information to the boss. It's happening across economic regulation too. 10 years, demographically, is their limit. That's probably the best case scenario because this, this is what government failure in real time looks like. Whether it's good or bad, of course, is entirely up to you and what you care about. Uh, this is a fun little document from the American Enterprise Institute. The double yellow arrows is pointing at exactly total inflation in the United States, roughly 75% since 2000. Everything above it is something in real terms that's gotten more expensive. Everything below it is something that's gotten cheaper. Oversimplifying here. But the stuff above requires fingers and eyes. People, that's the limiting factor. Healthcare. Everything below it beeps or you can plug it into a wall. Manufactured goods, most notably electronics. The Chinese system is based on mass manufacture fueled by bottomless subsidies. So if you can do it with a relatively unskilled population, and China's population is relatively unskilled, if all it takes is capital, they do it at scale. And we have benefited from that for the last 25 years. It's kept the cost of living down. That's the part we have to figure out how to replace, ideally in the next six years. The alternative, we don't have stuff. I'd rather have stuff. Inflation. United States and Canada, similar systems, similar patterns. On the far right, that's where we are now. It's been coming down pretty steadily for the last eight months. Why? Two things. Most of the inflation picture that we're having 
well, actually, a small part of the inflation picture we're having, maybe a quarter of it, is the baby boomers retiring. It's pure labor inflation. It's part of the system now. It will be part of the system for decades to come. The other three quarters is mostly COVID. Think back to those days. Every time we had an opening or a closing or a new vaccine or a new variant or an anti-vaxxer throwing a fit or a, a narcissistic hypochondriac getting a hold of policy, whatever it was, we changed what we did, what we consumed. And it takes about 18 months for industrial supply chains to catch up to changes in demand. Well, two years ago, Florida, Arizona, Texas reopened for the last time. Over the next five months, every American state plus Alberta followed. And then about three to six months after that, California and the rest of Canada joined in. It's been 18 months. And so you've seen inflation steadily coming down. Joe Biden deserves none of the blame for inflation going up, and he certainly doesn't deserve any of the credit for going back down. It was, it was us, and it's over. I'm more worried about longer term stuff, and for that we need to look back. So we've had three big phases of inflation in Anglo-America. We had that first bout of industrialization and urbanization. We built our cities, we ran power to the countryside. We had two decades of industrial demand-driven inflation. And then the horror of the baby boomers un was unleashed on us all. They raised their kids, they built their homes, and we had two and a half decades of consumer demand-driven inflation. And of late, we've been living in this weird-ass period. The Soviet system dissolved and poured an empire worth of raw materials on the world. Commodity prices were calm for a good long time. And the Chinese entered the chat with a billion industrial workers. For most of us, this is the sum total of our economic experience. And it has been the most atypical period in human history. But more importantly, it's over. The Russian stuff, for lack of maintenance, for war, for sanctions, doesn't really matter the cause, is all fading away. And the Chinese labor is literally dying out. The disinflationary trends are gone but the inflationary trends are back. The boomers may be retiring, but their kids, the millennials, are at the peak of their consumption years, and they have at least another eight years to run with that. And if we still want stuff in a post-China, post-Germany world, we're gonna have to build the industrial plant to do it. We're gonna have to double the size of the industrial plant on this continent. We're gonna have inflation around nine to 15% for six years. And if we fail to do that, we still have high inflation, we just don't have finished goods. And it doesn't stop. But if we do this, we will have an economic base that uses local workers and local resources to fill local orders for local consumers. Our supply chains will be shorter, more secure. They will be cleaner, they'll be more technologically advanced, they will use less capital, they will use less water and energy. And when we're done, we will have a system that is largely immune to international shocks. This isn't a good story. This is the story of the greatest economic growth in the history of Canada, Mexico, and the United States. It's just that it's not a straight line, and that's why it feels weird. All right, let's talk a little bit about Colorado. I know I'm already over time, probably. <laughs> okay. Three big things happening with internal population movements. What we're looking at here is not a population density map. We're looking at a population spread map. So if a country, or excuse me, if a urban area is red or orange, it physically can't expand. It hits a sea, it hits a mountain, it hits a national park, it hits another city, whatever it happens to be. But if it's blue or green, it has a lot of elbow room and it can sprawl. Three things going on. Number one, COVID. Who wants to be on a bus next to someone who's hacking up a lung? We're voting with our feet. We're moving away from the cities that you need mass transit to function. Those are the cities with circles. Number two, the boomers are retiring and they never want to shovel snow. They're moving where it's warmer. And then third, the millennials are finally, six years later than they were supposed to, having kids. 
and that means the coastal urban environment that they wanted for their 20s is no longer appropriate, and they're moving to places where they can have a yard. So they're moving out of the reds and the oranges and into the blues and the greens. And we're seeing a net gain for population centers roughly from Salt Lake City down the Front Range into Texas and up to about Richmond. That U is seeing strong population growth from internal migration, and everyone else is seeing population loss. Oversimplification, but that's kind of where we are, and I think that's where it's going to stick for the next decade. Now, on top of that, we've got the manufacturing picture. Here are our manufacturing mega regions where the population centers and the infrastructure allow integration for multiple supply chain steps. There's a lot of stories on here. Uh, the Texas Triangle is going to be the number one growth region because it's cheap land, it's cheap capital, it's cheap food, it's cheap energy, and it has access to Mexico. It's been our fastest growing zone for 30 years. It will be for the next 30. The, the southern states have figured out how to turn alcoholism into an investment policy. <laughs> they just get lots of bourbon, they go, they drink foreign investors under the table, they get them to sign things that they don't remember, and lo and behold, when they come home, it's a model that works. The northeast has no green space. They have to go up, but they're also losing people, so they're losing the finances to do services. They're gonna stay still, they're not gonna fall, but their ability to take advantage of what's coming I don't think exists. And then there's here. A couple things to keep in mind when you're talking about the Front Range and to a slightly lesser degree, Arizona. We live in a functional desert. There aren't a lot of farms, which means there aren't a lot of small towns. You just have the urban centers surrounded by a whole lot of really cheap land. The electricity system is a bit of a problem. The food system is a bit of a problem. But if you're looking to build a high-tech center, well, hot damn. Because to do that, you need cheap land. And here's the fun thing about Colorado. This bulge right here, these are those millennials who were seeking their experiences. But the ones who moved out to the coast ultimately moved back. The ones who moved here stayed. There are two kinds of millennials. There's the ones that meet all the negative stereotypes. Lazy, narcissistic, get up at the crack of noon on a Tuesday to start work. The data supports that. And then there's the other kind that we always shit on that have always done the right thing, that graduated from school early and didn't go off to Europe to find themselves, they went straight into the workforce. Both of them wanted their urban experience. But the ones who came to Colorado also wanted to be outside. We only got the second group. And the second group stayed. So I will continue to denigrate the millennials at every opportunity outside of Colorado, <laughs> because we got the good ones. We're not going to go into smelting. We're not going to go into textiles or agricultural processing. But the Front Range and the Arizona Sun Corridor, that's where the tech is going to be. And regardless of what you think of China or Taiwan or the rest, we're gonna have a limited ability to have a supply chain for those technologies, especially when it comes to high-end semiconductors. And for the most part, it's gonna be here. All right. If you're looking for more of the video log and the newsletter is on the left, it is free. I will never share your data with anyone. If you ever happen to come across something, however, that you're like, oh, I would have totally paid for that, give the money to the link on the right. That is MedShare. It's a charity I support. They provide medical assistance to communities who, for no fault of their own, have lost the ability to look after themselves. So, for example, if the Russians are bombing your power grid, MedShare will come in and help out with surgical kits, fuel, and generators for hospitals. This goes specifically to the Ukraine page, and for the month of November, I'm matching all donations. Okay. All right. I go down? Okay. Well, I'm going to grab my water. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a millennial, so 
I'm not sure if I'm offended or because I live in Colorado. Well, I'm, I'm just going to assume it. you're here yeah. for the right reason. You're exempt. Yeah, I'm exempt. You sit there. Well, thanks for the uh, the quick tour through demographics and the globe. No problem. Um, that was quite intriguing. I think one of the key things that stood out to me is we continue to go through. Uh, sorry, I, I should introduce myself. I'm Alex. Uh, I'm an economic club member and just here to facilitate a conversation with Peter. Mark? Uh, Mark Richards. Hello. Nice to have you all tonight. We'll, uh, we'll do a couple of minutes here grilling Peter, and then uh, we'll give the opportunity to you guys to uh, grill him as well and see if we can't stump him, but I, I doubt <laughs> it. <laughs> um, anyway, I was curious about the, the population um, charts. <coughs> and as we continue to reshape what uh, the future looks like, we're looking at fewer people. And I'd be interested, you know, as you think about <coughs> inflation, tightening labor supplies, tightening goods supplies, those pieces with a, a change in the working force, we're also then losing a big chunk of people that are buying less. How do those factors play into your view on the capabilities of the globe to handle whether it's inflation mm. or um, well, demand? On a global basis, you basically just put in a nutshell what the problem is. I mean, even if the United States decided or wanted to try to maintain the system, and I would argue that's beyond us, uh, there aren't enough young people on a global basis um, to consume what global production capacity is at the moment. Uh, so this was always going to end this decade. Uh, whether it's because there's a war or just a population bust, it really doesn't matter at this point. Yeah. I saw your video, I think last week you were in Columbus. That sounds right. Doing a video about an Intel plant. I travel a lot. <laughs> an Intel plant or something going yeah. up along mm -hmm. the Ohio River. I grew up close to the Ohio River and, and so that know that waterway pretty well. But um, what is the U.S.'s capability, but also the political interest in becoming a manufacturing powerhouse again? I, I feel like we've got a lot of headwinds from whether it's policy or regulation that slow the development of manufacturing. Well, something to keep in mind that of the first world countries, we have the lowest regulatory burden, bar none. And one of the advantages of being a federal system is you've got 50 different sets of policies and you can mix and match and try different things. And so all 50 states are not going to double their industrial plant. No. Just Texas. Texas is probably going to triple. Northern Mexico is probably going to triple. Uh, here, it's going to be a really squishy figure because so much of the tech sector is also in services, so it's kind of a hard measure. But different states are going to be able to take care of this at different angles. And if you're kind of looking for like the one thing to watch to determine if we can even try this, assuming the green transition stops today, assuming all we do is build out the industrial plant in order to produce our own manufactured goods, we need to increase electricity production in the United States by 50%. And if your community cannot get the extra power, then it's really hard for you to get into manufacturing. So it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of lead time here. I phrased that wrong. There's going to be a lot of leading indicators that tell us who is going to try to grab an outsized chunk of this. Uh, thanks, Peter. So uh, I, uh, you, you've stated yourself that you're not known for bringing rainbows and unicorns into the room. So, uh, but I'm uh, at heart an optimist and I uh, uh, have a hard time with uh, pessimism. I, I, I think it's uh, too natural for us to go to a <laughs> pessimistic scenario uh, because of our hard wiring. Um, and uh, you know, in the book, we talk about, at the end, in the end of the world, you talk about failed states and widespread famine. Uh, the U.S. has got a more optimistic outlook, but uh, parts of the world are uh, very dire in your predictions. Um, I just, uh, tonight, in front of the Economic Club, uh, if you'd like, I'm going to give you a chance to take it all back. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, we, when we think of globalization, we're usually thinking of transport and manufacturing, and there's nothing wrong with that, but every sector we have is globalized. And if you look at the original Green Revolution, lowercase g, the agricultural revolution of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, it was about bringing industrial inputs to lands that hadn't had them before. 
places that could not be major agricultural producers without synthetic fertilizers. The biggest beneficiary from that is Brazil. And the biggest provider of those things is Russia. And the biggest processor of these things is China. So it doesn't take any more than a mild case of deglobalization to break global, manu or global agriculture in its current form. And there's no way you do that without losing a billion people. So the countries that are able to have an indigenous supply system for agriculture are largely exempt. The places that were producing food before 1950 because they had good land and good weather are largely exempt. And the US is at the top of the list in both of those. We only import about 10% of our nitrogen fertilizer, only about 10% of our phosphate, and most of that comes from within the hemisphere. We do import 90% of our potash, but almost all of that comes from Canada. So, you know, they are good for something. Um, but those numbers are almost entirely flipped when you're looking at Australia or Brazil. So it's easy to massively increase your electricity production and then double the size of your industrial plant. That's the low-hanging fruit in the change that's coming. You, even if you're able to build out the replacement for the fertilizer and the transport system, you've still missed a half a dozen harvests. And that means you've lost a lot of people already. So wouldn't it be logical to think that there would be some adaptations that we're missing here? that there would be uh, a way to, uh, uh, as we're looking at failed states and widespread famine in China, um, having you know, social unrest and you know, uh, upheaval, uh, wouldn't uh, it, an, a, an adaptation be like uh, uh, you know, be deciding not to be so belligerent and, and to start play nice? Uh, to, I think, uh, I mean, I don't know if China is capable of that now. I mean, it's one guy now, and he no longer has, I mean, I'm not saying there's not going to be a war in Taiwan. I don't know, because Xi hasn't decided. Um, fun little story. During uh, the first month of the Ukraine war, when Putin was the one making all the nuclear threats personally, uh, the U.S. ambassador was dispatched, and he basically said, you know, I'm going to not tell you anything you don't know here. I'm just going to shine a light on what you do know from a different angle. It's like, you remember back two months ago? When um, the day you decided when the war was going to start, what day it was going to be on, you were in that bunker under the Kremlin that was the safe in the safe in the safe. Uh, no one was taking notes because you didn't want anything to leak out. There no possibility of electronic eavesdropping. And do you remember how an hour after you left that bunker, we shared the full minutes of that meeting with the media? That was our way of telling you that we know exactly where you are at any moment. So if you think you can fling a nuke into the Western Hemisphere. And the first half dozen that come back are going to go absolutely anywhere but directly up your ass. You're out of your mind. So stop it. And he did. Now it's all his flunkies making the threats. The point is that Russia, despite his flaws, Putin, despite his flaws, he, he has an inner circle. He has people he trusts. He has people that he discusses things with. And so you can tap his phones. You can hack his emails. You can get an idea of what's going on within the Kremlin. You can't do that in Beijing because Xi speaks with no one. Now, five years ago, I knew for certain that the understanding of the Politburo was that a war for Taiwan, even if they could capture the place easily, wasn't going to solve anything for them. In fact, it would be the end of China's industrial experience, because China imports 80% of its energy and 80% of the inputs that allow it to grow its own food. So you put two destroyers in the Indian Ocean Basin, and it all shuts down and you have a post-industrial collapse complete with a famine in under six months that within a couple of years probably kills half the population. They knew that. I don't know if they know that anymore. No one's certainly going to remind Xi of it. And so you've got this leader who is imbibing almost nothing but his own propaganda. The official strategic military plan for the PLA now, the People's Liberation Army, is Xi Jinping economic thought. He wrote a treatise on the role of military in society, and they now study that instead of doing proper wargaming. And so I can't tell you that there's going to be a kinder outcome here that's more based on compromise and reality. 
because she has made sure that he's not part of that reality. And that makes it unpredictable. Uh, but I don't think there's a lot of hope for kind of a, a nuanced negotiation here. You guys remember when Blinken went out in the aftermath of the balloon fiasco? He went so he could have a conversation with the foreign minister about how far up the information blackout want, went. And he found out that the foreign minister hadn't spoken to Xi in four months. It's just, it's just, it, this isn't a country anymore. This is just a march. Well, at least we have uh, living in the U.S. and in Colorado to, on our side. We've got that going for us. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not <laughs> suggesting we're the paragon of political discussion here, but at least we have a discussion. Yeah. Is, is that, you know, Mark, I, I think your question was, or at least where Peter you took it, was, was the unpredictability of uh, some erratic leaders. Hmm. And as I think about that, I think about our own erratic leaders or um, the people at least in the roles. Uh, I'm not sure we can call them leaders, but their capability to whether it's park a nuke up, you know, Putin's ass or park a destroyer in the South China Sea and the wherewithal, political wherewithal or, or you know, trading power that they've got mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Well, I don't, I don't, does, is it there today? I guess we have to talk about Biden. Um, we, we don't have to, we can no, talk we about don't, the general no, right. so, DC. Story. Well, it's when it comes to foreign policy decision-making, it's one guy. There's not an institution, there's a person. Uh, and Biden, from a foreign military strategic point of view, I think is kind of a, a B-rate president, which is the best we've had. Not Trump, not W, not Obama, not Clinton. Yeah, since Herbert Walker Bush. Definitely the best on security issues since Herbert Walker Bush. Admittedly, it's a low bar. Um, and he's clearly losing his mind. It gives you an idea of how low the bar is. <laughs> Uh, one of the beautiful things about having a president that's older than the pyramids is that he remembers the pyramids. <laughs> he's seen the long run of history, and he's definitely a subscriber to the age-old American doctrine that our system is so stable that all we have to do is outweigh them. Mm -hmm. And that's a correct assessment. Doesn't mean that we can't have better policy on a day-to-day -day basis. Definitely not saying that. Uh, on an economic point of view, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely in the bottom third. Um, but so were the last five. So, you know, it's, again, low bar. Um, politically, what we are going through right now is every generation or two, the factions that make up our parties move around. It's a feature of our electoral <clears throat> laws. Uh, and eventually some jump ship, some switch sides, the factions rise and fall in power within the coalitions, and at the end of the process, you get two fundamentally new, par par fundamentally new parties. This is the sixth time we've done this, and we are right in the middle of it right now. So the business community and the national security community have been kicked out of the Republican coalition, and the unions have left the Democratic coalition. And so if you're wondering why economic policy in Biden and Trump eras just makes no sense, that's because it makes no sense. Because the people who have been responsible for making economic policy in this country for the last 180 years, for the first time in 180 years, aren't even in the room. They're not allowed in the room. And you've got MAGA who wants to, who, who, you've got MAGA who thinks that the business community is part of the problem. And then you've got the Greens on the other side who want to punish the business community. And until such time as the unions or the business community or both end up in one or the other coalitions, this is just where we are. So this is definitely one of those times where thank God we're a federal system where the state and the local governments are responsible for most of the policies that affect us on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's look at uh, geopolitical again. Um, we've been hearing in the news about the axis of evil. Uh, yeah, it's and, back in vogue, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, we've certainly been uh, creating, uh, reviving NATO and uh, the uh, uh, idea of the allies banding together. Does this have any potential for, uh, realistic potential for another world war? given the alignments? Probably not. Um, what's going on in Gaza is a tempest in the teapot. Uh, the Israelis and Hezbollah have already made it clear that while they're with Hamas to the end, what the end means is the end of this press release. 
So there's not going to be any intervention there. And the Saudis have almost publicly come to the conclusion that they can't wait to restart negotiations with the Israelis on normalization. So Hamas and Gaza really are on their own. Um, that doesn't mean I feel great about that, because the, the human, humanitarian tragedy that is unrolling here, so far the best estimate is we've only got 10,000, only, only have 10,000 dead Palestinians. I'm amazed that number is so low. 40% uh, of the population has already evacuated Gaza City, which was the best infrastructure in the Strip. And so now we've got an area that has no food and no energy. Um, and people living three people to a cot. Uh, those numbers are going to skyrocket because it's going to take Israel at least a year to clear out Hamas. So this is going to get real ugly, but it's limited to Gaza. These people can't go anywhere. The Israelis would love if they all walked into the Sinai. And the uh, Egyptians said that the only way they will allow that is if the world allows them to shoot every Palestinian as they leave Gaza. Yeah, people forget that the Egyptians used to control Gaza from 48 to 73, and, <laughs> and no one had a good time. <laughs> um, so there, th th this isn't going to spread. That doesn't mean it's great. It doesn't mean if you should feel happy about it. It's just it's not going to spread. The, the war of the day that matters is, of course, the Ukraine conflict. Uh, you guys remember in the opening days of the war, that giant convoy coming down from Belarus and how it stopped on the fourth day because the Russians stopped, forgot fuel? That's when we found out that the Russians don't know how to fight a modern war, or really any war. Uh, it's not an army that can't do combined arms. It's, it's a mob with guns. But if there's anything we understand about the Russians is that they feel that in order to be secure, they have to limit the ability of outside powers to reach their space. And that means getting back to something roughly akin to the old Soviet boundaries. If they can do that, their total exposure to all international powers is only about 500 miles of territory that they have to block. Where they are now in post-Soviet Russia, there's over 3,500 miles. So they're, they're right on the reading of the map. And so if they are able to overwhelm Ukraine, they will go for Poland, Romania, Latvia, and the rest of the eastern tier of NATO. And we will obliterate them in a conventional fight, because they clearly can't function in that way. And then the only tool they will have left will be nukes, and they will use them. So we have to keep the battle bottled up in Ukraine in order to not lose Chicago. And that's why the decision was made so firmly and so consistently and so early on providing the Ukrainians with absolutely anything that they can prove that they can use and maintain. The Germans were very, very clear on that. The Germans have gotten a lot of shit they don't deserve. They're like, if you cannot maintain the equipment we give you, we're giving you paperweights. <laughs> Let's not waste anyone's time. Um, everything else is details. A lot of details. Anyway, that, that's a war that can escalate if it gets beyond Ukraine. And so that's critical. I don't know if I'd call it a world war, though. And then uh, China is stewing its, in its own juices. And if there is a conflict as China falls... It'll be a naval one, and it's going to be, will be one they're going to lose in a matter of weeks, if not days, because they can't project. They have a lot of ships, but they, only about 10% of their fleet can sail more than 400 miles from land in a combat scenario. Uh, and the only ports that they have beyond the Chinese mainland, they rely on American naval cover to reach. I mean, like Djibouti wouldn't, wouldn't help in a war at all. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really not concerned about the Chinese fall from a military point of view unless Xi just gets some wild-ass hair. Uh, just keep in mind that the degradation in decision-making that we've seen across the Chinese system applies to the military, too. And, you know, how do you fight a war if no one can make a decision? Well, that almost sounds optimistic. <laughs> it's like, I, I don't want to overplay it because it's, it's become a black box because of Xi, how Xi has structured the thing. Uh, that doesn't mean there can't be a war. I'm just saying that if there is a war, I doubt the Chinese are going to do nearly as well as a lot of people think. But they've got how many millions of troops? Yeah, but... If it's a ground war? If they go into Vietnam, they're going to be treated with the same gentle fury that they were the last time they went. They went right after we were in Vietnam, and they had just as much fun as we did. Um, India's on the wrong side of the Himalayas. Can't cross. Uh, Kazakhstan. What does the winner get? Uh, <laughs> Siberia. 
The Russians made it very clear under Yeltsin, a policy that has not been updated under Putin, that we won't try to meet you with tanks and troops. We'll just nuke you. So that leaves the ocean, and that means they have to swim. China can die on, in a box. It's entirely possible. It's happened many times in history before. The difference this time is that they've urbanized everyone, destroyed most of their farmland, and they have no replacement generation. So this really is the final generation of the Chinese existence. This is the end. Hmm. It's just a question of how they go out. And what does it look like at that point? Is it a regional, tribal kind of a... Uh, it's a possibility. I mean, th this will be, I think, the, I have to go back and get this number for sure. I think it's the 27th time that civilization has collapsed in China. This is not new. Uh, the whole over-centralization over and versus spin-out is the cycle we see over and over and over. If I was to guess, because of the over-urbanization, because of their dependence on foreign inputs to keep their population alive, I would guess that the northern section, which you can reach on horseback if you need to, um, will kind of fall in on itself and implode and have the worst famine in the human experience that'll kill at least half the population within a decade, um, and kind of falls into a neo-lordism, neo-Maoist tyranny of just um, The southern cities from Shanghai to Guangzhou will probably go their own way. Historically speaking, that's how it's always worked. And historically speaking, they've gotten the majority of their foodstuffs from not mainland Asia. It's a model that works, and maybe it'll work again. And then the interior, Tibet and Zhejiang. I know that a lot of people like to romanticize the people who live on horses in the plains, but do we not remember the Mongol Empire? These are <laughs> not nice people. They don't normally hang out in airports with saffron robes and, robes and smiles. <laughs> There's a reason that the Chinese treat them so badly. And as soon as that noose is off of their neck, oh my God. God, the bloodletting that will happen. That's a problem for another day, though. You talk about the potential inward collapse there in China, but it, it, to me, I would think you've got, what, 30-odd provinces in China that Give or take. all have their own little kings? And Not anymore. You know, he killed them all. He killed them all. Okay. Yeah. They were too corrupt. Yeah. So, well... We had, a, we had a 10-year anti-corruption program. The first five years, he got rid of all the regional leaders. The next five years, he gutted the two factions that put him in place. You guys remember uh, Hu Jintao and Zheng Zemin, mm -hmm. the former presidents? Those factions. You remember how last year, when uh, Xi anointed himself president for life, how he physically dragged Hu Jintao off the, off the, off the stage Sorry, on live story. television? Yeah. That was glorious. Oh my <laughs> God. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was horrible for Hu, but he was kind of jerk. Um, it's now just, gee, he spent the last three years going after business and academia. Okay. Yeah. Right. Sorry, Mark. Well, I was, it's, I was just going to, uh, again, try to uh, pivot towards optimism. Uh, who, <laughs> uh, who do you think is uh, going to be the winner besides the United States in this new glo global order and, uh, you know, after deglobalization? Um, you know, what, what countries that maybe haven't been reaching their full potential in the current sure. environment will, will thrive? I, I can break them into three categories, which there's some overlap. So the first are the countries that um, globalization was kind of a raw deal for them. They have good geographies. They have the ability to defend, defend themselves. They have a military that's right-sized to their needs. They're not dependent on international trade, never have been. But under globalization, everyone else rose up and the United States' backing of globalization meant that their good geographies didn't matter for 75 years. Now they will again. Uh, Japan, Turkey, and France are the big three. The Japanese, by the way, have cut a deal with both Trump and Biden. They're the only people who see this coming and they've gotten ahead of it. So good for the Japanese. France will be its own way, um, but we're gonna be siblings with all the arguments over pointless things that siblings have but at the end we'll have our back on anything that matters and then Turkey is absolutely going its own way. Uh, Argentina falls into that category if they can figure out how to get their heads out of their asses. Um, Any positives so, in Africa? 
Africa's a weird one. You, you kind of, you, you, you don't seem to talk about the continent. Well, much. yeah, the, the issue is that the geography is really, really hostile to integration and infrastructure. Yeah. You've got jungles, you've got deserts, you've got a series of stacked plateaus. The Chinese have put a ton of money into Africa. Right, but that's basically capital flight. That doesn't count. Yeah. Um, the, the African growth story of the last 15 years, to be perfectly blunt, is boomer capital. It's been a consumption boom. They've been borrowing. It's, it's a Greece story. And now that the capital is more expensive, it's already over. Yeah. Now, there are little pockets around the edges yeah. where the population can integrate because it's flat, and they have decent access to the sea, and these zones can participate in whatever's next. That's like Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Angola, uh, probably Senegal. And those zones have an interesting future, I think. Uh, but the rest of it uh, does not look good. Anyway, yeah. number one, the ones that had good geography before, that will matter again. Number two, the ones who have association with the United States, for whatever reason, Canada and Mexico being at the top of that list. And the third one being places where the geography would normally argue against them being successful, but it also means they're insulated from what's about to happen, and I think primarily about Southeast Asia in that regard. They've never really had a regional war because they couldn't get at each other through the mountains and the jungles. So you kind of have a mini globalization happening in Southeast Asia and then a degree of partnership within the Western Hemisphere with the Japanese kind of hand-holding among those three groups. Interesting. Yeah, that's still a pretty good story. Yeah. Well, um, Courtney is telling me it's time for questions from you all. and She's we've so got, bossy. She is. She's... <laughs> She, she, need, she, she needs a big clock, though, because we, we don't stay on track ever. Um, Thanks, Courtney, guys. where would you like to go first? We're going to go right here. Uh, hi, Peter. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm aware that two of your favorite English language news sources are Al Jazeera for anything that doesn't involve the Middle East and uh, France 24. For uh, anything that doesn't involve Europe. For anything, yeah. Um, also, I've, I've gotten some great uh, people to follow on uh, Twitter or X uh, by looking it's at Twitter. your account. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I, I would love to leave with some news sources. You, you are a top follow for me, or a, you know, a, a must watch, right? Mm -hmm. Your newsletter uh, and the videos. Uh, what news sources do you think do the best job of doing a, a, an, a, a, an analysis rather than a day-to-day -day like Al Jazeera or France 24. Yeah, France 24 and Al Jazeera are your good sources for, like you said, day-to-day -day awareness. Um, for analysis, whew. So, so what news sources would you be very sad to find out that they were suddenly closing shops? <laughs> um, the Economist, but two-thirds of the way through any article, just stop. <laughs> the, the last third is their prescription for a world that will never happen. Uh, but they have really good awareness in every country that matters and on almost every issue that matters. Just when they start to get preachy, I just kind of tune out. Um, Wall Street Journal is the best in the world of what it does. Just keep in mind that what it does is relatively narrow. Beyond that, it sucks. Um, over the last 20 years, tech, uh, technology has outpaced the ability of news organizations to adapt their models. And until such time as we find a more productive way to limit social media, uh, I don't think it's gonna come back. Now, we will get there. This isn't the first time we've been here. When the Telegraph came out, we had yellow journalism, which was literally people making shit up shit up about whatever they wanted. It was very social media of the day. And it, it took a couple decades for us to get libel laws. So we need to reform the 1996 Telecommunications Act. That's the one that means that no matter what you post on whatever forum, neither you or the forum are liable for anything. And if we can find a way to amend that, to have a more constructive conversation, then all of a sudden media can be back in business at every level. Uh, but until that happens, uh, the lies are seductive, they're popular, and the business model for the old media just doesn't work. Because, I mean, I don't even have a television. Am I the only one here? <laughs> I see lots of Manani millennials. Okay, it's not just me. We have another, another over here, Peter. 
Hey, Peter. Uh, so, I had a couple of questions. One, because um, every time I've heard you talk about the Jones Act, I, I, I know, I know. I just, uh, I was wondering if you could do me a solid and just steal man the argument, however idiotic you might find it, um, about why someone would think it's a good idea to have it keep going. And then my other question I wanted to squeeze in is with, you know, Congress right now is trying to squeeze Ukraine aid, Israel aid, and the smorgasbord of fights that are going on about how much. Where do you see that going in terms of American commitment with as domestic politics keep firing up? I mean, we have rallies and riots all the time about helping people. But here we are spending 100 billion plus on Ukraine aid. Where do you see that going in the future? Do you think the American public is going to continue stomaching um, foreign aid? The, the American public is wildly misinformed about the reality of the situation. The aid to Israel to this point is very thin because the Congress hasn't acted yet. And the aid to Ukraine is over 90% used equipment that was slated for destruction. So honestly, the Ukrainians, from a financial point of view, are doing us a solid. It's probably <laughs> destroyed uh, by now. Yeah. Uh, so it's like it just the, the countries that have sent cash to Ukraine are primarily European. Uh, and by the way, the Europeans for the last four months have sent more in total value of stuff to uh, the Ukrainians than we have. Uh, so again, the, the story is because that people have a benefit they perceive in basically lying to everybody on a regular basis. Um, so, I mean, you're still asking the right question, what will people tolerate, but people don't understand what they're tolerating. I mean, our, our financial contribution to the Ukrainians is negligible. Uh, to your earlier question, Jones Act, it's really very simple. Uh, the jobs in the domestic shipbuilding and management industry are 100% unionized. And the unions have left the Democratic coalition. And we need to double the size of the industrial plant. How many of those jobs do you think are blue collar? So we're at the start of the greatest run of organized labor in this country's history. And no one in Washington wants to piss them off. Even more than the 30s. Much more. Yeah. Huh? Got a couple down front, Courtney. And, okay. Hi, Peter. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for having um, me. So in reading your book, listening to some of your podcasts, I think one of the things that you do that is part of what makes you so interesting is you follow these trends, whether they're demographic or economic, to their logical conclusion. But in reality, there seems to be a lot of other things that come into play, whether that's substitution, new technologies, new trading blocks, all sorts of things. And what I found in kind of your book was that you followed kind of the current paths down their logical conclusions. I'm curious where you see places where you think there's a big margin of error in your analysis sure. or conclusion, or where you think that, you know, certain countries or geographies might actually have a chance to really change what seems like the logical conclusion that they're leading to. Yeah, I would argue that any futurist is going to have some version of that issue because you've got to choose the things that you think are going to change the trajectory, trajectory versus the things that aren't. Um, I think one of the reasons why I'm in a better position than most is because I do so much with demographics. And if you want to move the demographic profile, you have to start decades in the past. And until we figure out either mass cloning, Star Wars style, they have to like come out of the box with skills, um, or time machine, um, we're, we're kind of locked in to those forecasts. Geopolitics a little bit different. Individual decisions do matter, and every once in a while we do get a leader who twists history. I don't think Biden's that person. I think Trump was, and I think Trump sped it up. The challenge and what I do is figuring out what to ignore. And that's where technology gets really, really tricky. Uh, because if we figure out a new battery chemistry, for example, then all of a sudden the green revolution goes from this weird, expensive waste of time to something that really can change the human condition. It just takes that one thing. Now, we don't have anything that's even at the prototype stage. And today, the next generation of nuclear reactor was canceled. 
So even my backup plan for you know, what the green transition might involve has now fallen through. Uh, but the problem with technology in general is it requires two things to move at pace. You need a lot of capital to pay for it, and you need a lot of young people who are wired together to imagine the future. Well, the millennials are getting too old and the capital is now gone. So if technology can't at scale be part of the problem, we have to deal with the tools that we have now. Or rely on specific leaders to take us down a, a different path. And Wakanda? <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> Just throw some vibramian at it. Hey, Peter. Uh, question is about US national debt. Oh boy. So there is a lot of talk about the boogeyman there. Um, maybe give you a little bit of the perspective there. Did inflation help out with devaluing that debt? No. Um, where you see that going, uh, does it scare you? A little. Uh, <laughs> how do we manage that? We don't. <laughs> Hyperinflation? No. Okay, so um, we just. Next year, it looks like we're going to have one trillion in interest payments. That's a that's a big number. You know, that's that's significantly more than defense. Uh, but I still don't overly worry about it. So a couple things. Number one, um, the Japanese have shown us that even with an egregious level of debt, a first world country that keeps most of it domestic can manage just fine. So if you include their pension arrears, they're at 500 percent of GDP now. So we can quadruple our debt level before we get into something that might push the envelope. That is, this is not a recommendation. That's 500%? Good. Yeah, yeah, 500% of GDP. That's, that's not pushing the envelope? F from a national coherence point of view, no. I'm not saying there's not an opportunity cost. Yeah. If we had stuck with the Clinton pr program from 35 years ago, or however long it's been, we would have paid the debt down to zero, we would have already paid for the retirement of the baby boomers, we would have in a very different macroeconomic environment. And you know, as a fiscal conservative, I would have loved that. We made different choices. A series of bipartisan presidents made very different choices. We forget, often, that it's not one party or the other. W set the record in the post-war era for deficits. Obama said, hold my beer, and he doubled it. Trump came in and was like, mm, I'm going to make it huge. <laughs> and then we have Biden, who is on track to double it again. This is across the parties. Um, however, we're the global currency, and there's no pretender to the throne. At the BRICS summit in South Africa, the Chinese, the Indians, and the South Africans said they had no interest in a non-US dollar-denominated world. None. Wasn't picked up here because that didn't match the de-dollarization mantra that is going around. But in the rest of the world, the only country that really wants to move beyond the dollar is Russia, and they just want everyone to use the ruble. No, Chinese. Chinese don't want to The Chinese don't. No, they're very happy with the dollar. Um, as long as that's the case, we can do things with our currency that no one else could do, and that includes monetization. Now, again, this is not a recommendation, but the first roughly $800 billion of deficit spending <clears throat> as a percentage of GDP, that's right at our average growth rate for the last 50 years. So that's kind of free, if you will, and we can go up to 500% of GDP. So at the current rate that the debt is increasing, we still have at least another century and a half. Covers me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, again, this is not my recommendation. The opportunity cost is significant, but we're not staring down a monster here, at least not for a few decades. And keep in mind that everyone else is in such a worse position because we have, again, the millennials, or as I like to think of them, the taxpayers of tomorrow. Checkbooks. Peter, Leo Tillman, um, thank you for the talk. One of the most fascinating talks I've heard in quite some time. Thanks. Um, what is the scenario where Russia expands beyond Ukraine? The list of countries that they feel they need to dominate in order to get what they feel they need. Um, and by the way, this is the ninth post-Soviet war, not the first. So there, there's a pattern here. If you think you can just give the Russians some land and they'll stop, you clearly don't know recent history. In no particular order, Moldova, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, 
parts of Romania, parts of Poland, Azerman, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan for sure, probably Uzbekistan as well. What are the conditions? Okay. Uh, the Putin plan for the first two decades of his reign, feels weird saying that, uh, was that all we have to do is make sure that the West isn't present and that we control the top level elite so that we can have this as a buffer that we control, but we don't necessarily have to occupy. And what they've discovered in the last 10 years is that doesn't work. Because if you have a cozy, corrupt elite that's beholden to the Kremlin that generates resentment, even if no one on the outside is manipulating events. And one of the things that deglobalization is bringing us is other people manipulating events. It used to be during the Cold War that if an ally started mucking around with Soviet interests, we brought the hammer down on them. Because nuclear war was the risk, and if there was going to be an escalation, we wanted to make sure we had that on a very tight leash. With the United States stepping back, all of a sudden everyone else is doing things on their own. Uh, and one of the things that the Russians are having difficulty processing is the most aggressive supporters of Ukraine aren't American. They're Polish, they're British, they're French. Oh my God, the French are in the game again. It's so much fun to watch. Uh, but there's now 50 capitals, including the Australians, who just don't want to feel left out, who are playing very, very actively across the former Soviet space. And there's very little effort from the United States to ride herd on this because Biden can only focus on so many things at a time. And I don't mean that as a slam on Biden. That's just the nature of the world that we're in now. And that means that the Russians' only option is direct control. And so it's an occupation. It's a deliberate genocide to whittle down the numbers. Go ahead. Um, talk to us a little bit about California. What are you after? You know, on, on, the, on, on, the, on, its, on its progression, right? I mean, it, it really dominated U.S. economic sort of momentum for, you know, 50, 60 years. Okay, well, think about the environment we've been in for the last 40 years. We've had the baby boomers, mean, at the peak of their consumption, then moving into the peak of their investment. And those two trends dominated a lot of American trend, uh, economic patterns, especially in California. Uh, California before the 80s was kind of backwards wasn't in the top tier, certainly didn't have Silicon Valley. They had an agricultural system that was because uh, they just couldn't compete with the, the Midwest or the general South. But with globalization and with the baby boomers turning to capital providers, that shifted. Globalization set the East Asian rim on fire from a growth point of view. And a lot of manufacturing moved there. But Americans still wanted stuff, so we imported largely through the West Coast. And so that's, that's the, the Long Beach story. Uh, that's at least a third of the LA story. Uh, that's part of the Tacoma story and the Seattle story. Uh, second, all of this capital combined with millennials seeking their urban experience. That's the Silicon Valley story. And so we had this weird transformation where manufacturing left, but processing of manufactured goods became huge. The agriculture changed because instead of them producing beef and wheat and rice, they sold to the price insensitive Chinese and produced cherries and pistachios, products with very, very, very high margins, environmentally devastating, but you know, California is not consistent, uh, but it made a huge amount of money for the Valley. And then Silicon Valley would do the programming and the design of systems to help digitize and what's the word, dematerialize a lot of productive processes. And so that hurt a lot of the United States, especially the old steel belt. But the people who managed that process and developed that process in California did very, very, very well for themselves. So California went higher and higher and higher up the value added chain in a number of industries. Well, that trends over. Their number one source of population growth, number one and number two for the last 30 years has been migration from the south, that's now negative, or migration of millennials in, that's now negative. The capital is no longer there. And when China breaks, that's the last of those three big trends that created the California we now know. And they'll be left with regulation. That's not enough to run a system on. So they're going to have to reinvent themselves. 
Now, they've done it before. I have full confidence they can do it again. The question is, how long is it going to take them? I would say more than five years. And in that time, California becomes the sick man of the United States. Got one in the back there. Hello. Um, Hi. So a question I've had, we, we've talked a lot about Ukraine and we've talked a lot about Russia and um, both sides needing to win that conflict. From Technically, we just need to not lose, but I follow you. You're right. They need to not lose. So how does this play out? Um, you know, I've listened to a lot of the things you've said over the years that have kind of come to fruition, but how do you see this that. conflict playing out? <laughs> and hopefully it's an answer that doesn't include the nukes. <laughs> um, anyone who feels that they've got a good grip on where this is going is not being honest with themselves. Everyone's assessments, my own included, were proven wrong in the first week of the war and then the first month of the war and certainly by the end of the summer. Uh, that the Russians could botch it so completely that the Ukrainians with nothing more than a few jeeps could have two lightning counter offensives that would just regain so much territory so quickly. Oh my God. And then now the Russians have rediscovered how to fight a defensive war so they can be taught. Um, it's up in the air. Uh, there's two ways this can go, in my opinion. Whether or not it goes quickly or slowly, I don't know. Uh, number one, they eventually do overwhelm Ukraine, the Russians. Uh, if they do that, it will be because the West loses the ability to supply them with equipment for political or more likely for material weapons, or material reasons. Our ability to manufacture what they need is limited, and once we get through all of those back stocks, we will have the choice between giving them our mainland stuff or very little. We're not gonna hit that this year, we're not gonna hit that next year, but probably the year after. Uh, they are spinning up, um, we are spinning up what we can produce, but it takes time. Uh, the Russians are spinning up faster and their tolerance for pain is much higher and that's before you consider their ability to, say, bring in stuff from China or Iran or North Korea or wherever else. Those all come with their own ifs, ands, and buts, but it's a more reliable product stream than what we can do in the long run. And then if we do get to Poland, where we are forced into a direct fight, we will have nukes fly, and that's one of the reasons why the Biden administration is pulling out all the stops on missile defense. There's a fear we're gonna need it. Second scenario is the Ukrainians win. But even if they purge the Russians from all of their pre-war territories, that's not enough. The Russians know that if they lose this, they cease to exist as a coherent country in under two decades. And so they're going to try again and again and again, as long as they can. And so for the Ukrainians to prevent that from happening, they will have to cross into Russia proper and neutralize a couple of major logistics hubs. That's an invasion of the motherland. That would justify nuclear use too. So we're in this really weird ass, unfortunate situation where the best case for us is to fight to the last Ukrainian within Ukraine. Now, the Ukrainians I've talked to in the government, they're fine with that because they know the alternative is to die to the last Ukraine at Russian hands without weapons and the ability to fight back. And for them, there's no choice here. I would love for there to be a third way. I don't think there is. Uh, got a question, Courtney, is that, how much time do we have? Yep. Yikes, I don't want to follow that. That's okay. It's pretty dire. <laughs> so um, thanks for giving us a lot to think about, Peter. So uh, two part question. Um, there's a lot of headwinds out there, obviously, that you've identified uh, globally uh, so, and there's a lot of countries, you haven't mentioned the recession word, uh, is that coming? And, you know, it's in Germany, it's, it's in a lot of parts of the world now, is that where the U.S. is heading? And then second part, how do we trade this? You know, you've got a lot of ideas, there's some, we're all capitalists at the end of the day, so uh, next two years, what are you short and what are you long? I don't, I don't play the short game. Well, not companies. I just yeah. mean com uh, countries and industries. And let what let do me you do like? the second one first. Um, I'll just tell you what I do. I'm very bullish on the United States in general. 
but I also have a very good appreciation for the countries that are going to help us turn the page historically. The problem is that most of them, like Mexico, don't really have functional capital markets. So I like U.S. large and mid cap in manufacturing, more and more small cap. I like companies that are energy intensive in their operation because we have the cheapest electricity and chemicals and uh, oil on the planet. I like companies um, where the demand for their product is demographically driven because we have the healthiest demography in the rich world and Mexico has the healthiest demography in the advanced developing world. And if that end product is also exportable, I really like it because that means that we've got competition around the world that's going to be falling and they're going to need this stuff. So I like chemicals, I like refining, I like food processing. And I like anything that deals with urbanization in the United States because we have so much population movement internally that that U of uh, cities all need to expand their physical footprint. Uh, so that's what I do. Um, what was the first question? Recession. I don't know. I understand why people think that there might be a recession imminent. I understand why people have been thinking that for over a year. I, I don't know. We're in such a weird place, historically speaking, that the normal supply demand trends don't line up in a way that they have before. I mean, I understand why inflation's high. But we need to expand so much in terms of industrial infrastructure that it's going to overwhelm a lot of the normal activity that we see. And the combined consumer base in the United States still has a trillion dollars of cash. And we're still an economy that's two thirds driven by consumption. So it doesn't feel to me like a recession is preordained, even though I understand all the warning signals, whether it's the yield curve or inflation or something else. I get it. I understand. Something, though, that you have to increasingly take into account, especially when you're looking beyond the United States. Every economic theory we have, every economic indicator we follow is predicated on a relatively stable relationship among capital, labor, supply, and demand. And when you flip the demographic pyramid, none of it makes sense anymore. So outside of the US, these measures are going to become increasingly useless. And even in the United States, we're still aging. So the relationships aren't going to be as firm as they used to be. That's going to make your job harder. But it's going to make foreign direct investment really interesting. Thanks, Peter. We're going to take just a couple more questions. So I'm just curious to know, you haven't talked about AI. Okay. And I'm just curious to know what your thoughts on that as a shock to the system. Sure. So let me give you the good and the bad. First, the good, so I can end where I'm more comfortable. Um, I, as a rule, don't bet on technology solving our problems because there's a, there's a time horizon. You have to get to a certain point of development before it can be applied at scale and solve the problem. And if you had asked me 18 months ago if I thought AI was going to make it, I would have said no. I mean, yes, they can recognize cats in videos. The economic case for that is somewhat limited. Chat GPT, when it came out a few months ago, partially changed my mind. This is something that's like right at the tipping point now. And that's really interesting to me. However, the ecosystem to produce the sub four nanometer chips that are necessary for AI to work is the most vulnerable industrial process we have on this planet. 90% of the chips are made in one town in Taiwan, and the fabrication facilities that allow those fabrication, or sorry, the, 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 the supply chain that allows those fabrication facilities to function is fully global, and half of that supply chain only produces one product, half of the companies in that supply chain only provide one product for one customer with no competition anywhere in the world. A single country, doesn't matter which one really, falls out of the constellation and the fabrication stops. So we're in this race right now. Can we produce enough of the high-end chips before that system goes down in order to apply AI? And will we have enough that AI can manifest everything that we hope it can do this decade? And I don't think we can. We're going to be able to apply it to maybe one or two things. Is that agriculture, so we save a billion lives? Is that defense? 
finance? Is it automation? We're going to have to decide that as a society and as a government. But every day that that's, these facilities keep running is just a little bit more of capacity that we can throw at things. If I were a betting man, I would guess that it would go to defense and agriculture, just playing the numbers. Uh, but that would require a very, very firm government hand in that decision making. Because we all know that you guys are going to use it for stock trading. <laughs> so you're really between the whether it's the chips or the manufacturing boom in the U.S. You know, back to Mr. Zollner's question, is you're talking about a, a super cycle in commodities. I was waiting for the a, question. I'm sorry. You're talking about a commodity boom. How to trade it? Oh God, no, 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 no. I am okay. giving, providing no advice on that. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's like commodities are going to be a, a mess, especially industrial commodities. Because of supply chains. Well, it's, it, for industrial commodities, the mines are in one place, the processing in another place, the value added to components is in a third place, and the market's in a fourth. Yeah. That's easy to break, especially since most of the processing's in China. Right. So that processing has got to be part of our industrial build out. Does that kill the Green Revolution too? That's one of the many things that's going to kill the Green Revolution. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Courtney. Okay, we're going to do one last question and then wrap it up. Oh, make it awkward. <laughs> you came to the right place. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the most provocative things you said that I think has been kind of glossed over was a claim around kind of some pretty extreme inflation. Okay. Um, you, I think, is really connected to deglobalization and kind of nearshoring or kind of bringing manufacturing back and that causing inflation. Throw some demographics in there, too. Yeah, and I guess one of the things that I'm curious about, and I guess you're, from your comments before, you're kind of overlooking the debt challenge and things like that, or I don't know if overlooking, but you're taking that as uh, something we can just handle. But No, I, I fold it in. I mean, we're, we have to do this industrial build-out in a time of limited labor and capital. That's inflation. So I guess the, the basis of my question then is that in a, in a world in which we have shrinking demographics, which require more stimulus in order to sustain our growth, in a world in which we have huge debt built up, whereas we have high interest rates, that sinks the rest of our economy, how do we realistically... I, I disagree with that last statement. Okay. We are perfectly can... capable of having high interest, high inflation, high growth all at the same time. How, how do you think we handle, though, a high inflation, high interest rate type of world, given demographic challenges that we're maybe better suited than most for, but still have our challenges, and also with a huge debt load, that if we load up high inflation, it's going to necessarily lead to high interest rates? How, how can those things coexist in a way that doesn't collapse the system? Think of the 1970s, but with growth that is four times as high. Not stagflation, hyper growth at the same time we have, not hyperinflation, but very high inflation. And when you do that, the winners and the losers in the economic and the political system get thrown into a blender and a different society comes out on the other side. The fact that we're going through a political transition at the same time, honestly, we're a little fortunate because the things that were already broken politically, we're not going to miss. <laughs> Now, whether it'll look better on the other side from any of your point of view, I don't know. I'm just telling you it's going to be very, very different. The power centers politically and economically 10 years from now are going to be radically different than what we've become used to for the last 50 years. So if you're looking at full societal transformation. I don't know how that's going to shake out yet. If I did, I would tell you. Great. Thank you, Peter. Just keep in mind, we've been through this six times before. We will get through it. Memories are short, right? Well, it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> never, never as good as you think it is or as bad as you think it is or will be. It's going to be a wild ride. Already mm -hmm. is. Well, it's been a wild uh, discussion and uh, wide ranging as expected. Uh, lots to think about. And uh, thanks so much for staying the full duration. Keeping. Oh, I live here. I don't have to catch a flight. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, Thank you all for coming tonight. It's been a real enjoyable evening, and uh, I hope uh, everybody's leaving with a good takeaway and something to think about. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to underline, this is a good story. <laughs> this is the fastest growth, not in our lifetimes, in our country's history. This is great. Just... <laughs>
Peter. Appreciate it. Well, thank you.